So hello, everyone. I'm uh, Joe Dumit. I'm the professor of science technology studies and anthropology and the director of the Institute for Social Sciences. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to the latest installment of our noon lecture series. Thank you all for coming. Uh, the noon lectures represent a continuation of a program launched at what used to be the Institute for Governmental Affairs. That series hosts distinguished speakers, both from UC Davis and across the country, who address the most pressing issues of the day. The Institute for Social Sciences is pleased to continue this tradition. The noon lectures are just one of many events hosted or supported by us. To keep up to date on these or other events and funding opportunities, groundbreaking social science research taking a place across campus, you can subscribe to our email newsletter and you can check us out online uh, at socialsciences.ucdavis.edu and on Facebook and Twitter. Today we're delighted to welcome Kristen Lagatuda, professor of psychology and a core member of the Center for Mind and Brain here at UC Davis. Dr. Lagatuda investigates children's and adults' emotion understanding, theory of mind, moral cognition, social categories, reasoning about uncertainty, decision-making, and future forecasting. In addition to age-related changes, Dr. Lagatuda is interested in sources of individual differences in social cognition, including executive control, visual attention, and mental health. She's the editor of the 2014 book, Children in Emotion, New Insights into Developmental Effective Science, and associate editor for the journal Developmental Psychology. In 2015, she received the UC Davis Distinguished Teaching Award for undergraduate teaching. And her lecture is entitled, Do Prior Experiences Shape Future Expectations? Children's Developing Intuitions About How Mind Generalizes from the Past. She'll speak for approximately 45 minutes, and then we'll have time <laughs> for questions and answers. Yes, sounds good. Welcome. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak here today. I'm really excited to see how many students um, are in the audience and hopefully um, this will be a little bit of break from regular lectures in both, I know a lot of you are coming from cognitive development class and many of you have taken developmental psychology with me before. Um, so it's exciting to actually go into a little bit more nitty gritty about how you actually do um, research methods on a particular question versus doing really large overviews of research fields. So. My, just to tell you a little bit about my lab. So my lab's located um, at the Center for Mind and Brain. It's called the Mind Emotion Development Lab. And um, what I'm really interested in um, studying, and I have been really since undergraduate years, is how children come to think about people in relation to their internal mental states. What they want, what they believe, what they think about, what they're remembering, and so on. Because this is really core to how we form social relationships, how we make predictions and um, form explanations about why the people around us are doing what they're doing, including our own um, self-actions. I've also got very interested, actually as an undergraduate, in how um, children come to understand that your mind shapes emotions too. So a lot of the theories at the time were focused on when do children who are like three and four years old learn to pair situations with emotion. So, Falling down makes you sad, getting a present makes you happy. And I was wondering, well, could they actually go a little bit more beyond that? Do they understand that you could feel happy or sad even in the absence of something happening to you in the current situation? Maybe if you started to remember about something sad in the past, did, would they understand that that would change your emotions in the here and now, even though nothing's happening to you right now? And a lot of this aspects of how the mind influences emotions and also how when you're feeling in certain kinds of moods, it shapes how well you can think and problem solve. A great example is test anxiety. If you're feeling really anxious about taking a test or maybe you're really mad about something that happened before the test has something to do with the test, it's still gonna shape how well you can think and problem solve. So I got very interested in, okay, what, what age does this um, knowledge appear in children because it really has very strong implications for regulating emotions and for overall mental health. And I also became very interested in, okay, well, things happen to people in life, right? What happens to you might be different than what happens to me, and we all have different ways of responding to current situations and different ways of thinking about what might happen next. So I was very interested in how do children come to understand how past experiences inform how you're feeling and thinking and making decisions right now, but also how that might push forward to the future and the kinds of future-oriented decision-making you might have. Um, so to do this, we study three to 12-year-olds primarily and adults. Um, adults are not just used as a comparison group because we wanna see where it ends up, but also because adults are still learning about social cognition too. It's not that adults have all the answers and it's not that once you hit 12 years of age, you know how to reason about people perfectly, 
we're really interested in some of the biases that adults bring to these kinds of situations as well. So in very broad sweep, what we found um, through lots of studies um, that there really are important foundations to this understanding during the preschool years, so by even in place by three to five years of age, but that these kinds of understandings continue to develop um, over the course of middle childhood, so between five and 12 years of age, and also into adulthood. So you see differences between even older children and adults. So what I wanted to focus on today is something that I think is really intriguing. Um, so a lot of my earlier work in how children learn to make connections between thoughts and emotions was very past-oriented. So when do they understand that being reminded about something from the past can change your emotions right now, even though nothing's happening to you? And then I started to think more about it, and I thought, well, the future is actually probably the most intriguing. This keeps having interference. I'm going to leave that. Is really intriguing because we don't know what's going to happen next. And so um, you don't know if something good or bad is going to happen next. You don't know whether you should make approach or avoidance decisions. Um, there's a lot of aspects about the future that's really intriguing because of its uncertainty element. And so I thought, well, this could be a really fascinating place to look at how children may learn to integrate what's happened before to thinking about what will happen next. So as adults, there's a lot of literature in adult social cognition, um, and it's coming from social cognition, but also health decision making, financial decision making. You can look at it in any kind of topic, but we frequently base our expectations about what's going to happen in the future on what's happened in the past. So we make a lot of forecasts, whether they're very fancy forecasting mathematical models or just hunches or intuitions, we use our past experiences in order to inform these. There's a fancy term that um, has been coming out a lot more in psychology recently called mental time travel. And the idea is that if you can bridge the past and the present and the future in your mind, you're basically traveling mentally through time. You're thinking about these connections through time in a mentalistic sort of way. But what a lot of um, researchers argue is this is really important for how do you assess risk, whether you're going to um, think something good or bad, um, whether you're going to approach or avoid a certain um, situation, how you're going to decide to either help someone, not help someone, be friends with someone, not be friends with someone, that we use a lot of this integration from past to present to future to make these kinds of judgments. So what I'm going to talk to you primarily about today is looking at um, age-related changes and um, development in how in children's understanding that people's past experiences do carry forward in time. So what's happened to you in the past is going to shape how you're thinking and feeling and acting right now, and also how you envision what the future is going to be like. So I wanted to highlight one article. So this one um, you can find um, in the library databases if you're interested in reading a very long document about it. Um, but I wanted to highlight um, some key points of this. So one way we did this is we took um, a large sample of four to 10 year olds and adults and we gave them eight scenarios, so eight stories involving characters who re-encounter someone who they had multiple experiences with in the past. So in a low risk or double positive situation, that person helped them twice in the past. So they did two positive things. In a high risk situation, or at least what I would think adults would think is a high risk situation, um, double negative. So they, two negative past events. They harmed this target twice in the past. And then we did two different kinds of ambiguous risk situations. So what if someone harmed you one time and the next time they saw you, they helped you? Or what if they helped you first and you're thinking everything's good and then the next time you see them, they harm you? So these are, were really intriguing to me because from a mathematical standpoint, they're 50-50 situations, right? These should be no different from each other from a mathematical standpoint. One good, one bad. What do you do with that kind of situation? Um, but what I wanted to see is whether or not, and I'll explain this more in several slides, whether or not people care, and whether it changes with age, the order in which these things happen. Is that meaningful? So in order to get at order, and I'm, I'm going to go into more detail about this, we also showed these as movies on an eye tracking monitor. So why would we want to incorporate eye tracking? So this is a Toby T60 eye tracker. It doesn't look like much, but they cost around $50,000. Um, <laughs> And they're scary to have because they cost so much money. Okay. Um, 
why it's cool is because for many, many years, so when I started as an undergrad and did my honors thesis on these kinds of things, um, I had paper and Crayola markers and lamination and Velcro, and I put them up on an upright board, and I put the stories up on the board. And it works really well, because the kids like ripping down the Velcro, and you get them through multiple stories that way. But one thing I kept noticing was a lot of times the young kids would look at the past event information, but they'd never say it in part of their predictions or explanations. And I thought, wouldn't it be fascinating if you could actually measure how they're inspecting past event information when they're making a future-oriented forecast. And you could look at age differences, you could look at individual differences, and who's weighting the positive stuff more, who's weighting the negative stuff more. So there's a lot of, this crosses a lot of fields in psychology and also in communications and probably a lot of different disciplines, but communications and advertising definitely. People look at eye-tracking information because it can give you like real-time information about how people are waiting, caring about, attending to certain kinds of information. So they can be useful for looking at, as I was saying before, age-related differences and also individual differences in what you think is most important when you're gonna make these kinds of judgments. So in this project, we were looking at whether or not there's age-related differences in reasoning about these high, low, and ambiguous risk situations and when they evaluate these NP and PM things, where you harm and then help, or help and then harm, do they give more weight to certain kinds of information? Do they care about the first thing someone did, the last thing someone did? Do they care more what the, whether it was a good or bad thing that that person did? And we're gonna be looking for this not just in their judgments, but also in their eye movement patterns to see if we could predict verbal judgments just based on where we see they're looking. And then we're also looking at, are there connections between visual attention to past history information and individual differences in reasoning? So again, can we predict people's verbal judgments based on their looking patterns? So just to show you, um, I'll show you an actual movie of this in a moment with the eye tracking, but this shows you what the final scene is. Um, and so you can see how we varied the positive and negative events. So in this one, the short haired girl gives Megan a nice picture. The next time she sees her, she gives her cookie she made. And then several days later, Megan sees her at school and she's asked to make some future-oriented judgments. In a double negative, she tried to shove her off the tire swing. She told her she couldn't play with them. Positive followed by negative. She gave her a nice picture, but the next time she saw her, she tried to shove her off the swing. Versus, same exact things in reverse order. She tried to shove her off the swing, but then she gave her a nice picture the next time she saw her. Um, and we went through loads of pre-testing to make sure that on the negative and positive events we cared, they were equal to the negative events were considered by children and adults as negative as the positive events were considered positive. We looked at um, visual interest and how the pictures were drawn to make sure everything was balanced and all that because in order to make judgments about what we wanted to do, you had to make sure you covered all that um, experimentally. So you can read about that in the paper if you wanna see how you go through months of figuring that out. Okay, but why you want to do that is because you don't want to go through then a year of testing 200 something people and then a reviewer comes and says, hey, you didn't balance this for this. So always be careful ahead of time. Okay, what did they predict? They predicted thought. So whether the character thought something good or bad will happen next. We also trained um, the kids and the adults how to do verbal likelihood judgments. So uh, whether whatever they thought was gonna happen might probably or definitely will happen. And we have um, other papers just how we trained that and what um, sort of age differences and understanding those labels. We had them predict whether the character felt worried or happy, including how intensely worried or happy. And they, get, they got a lot of pre-training on how to use these scales. So little, medium, very worried or happy. And whether they would go near or stay away. And we did whether it was gonna be a little or very. So would you go a little far away or very far away? Um, from this person. So, and then we recorded eye movements throughout. So this is a video um, I'll show you of a six-year-old female so you get a sense of what the questioning is like. The red dot you see is where she's fixating. So you can get a sense of how, when, you hear, when she hears the narration, how she follows those scenes with her eyes. Let's see if I can get this. It should take, there it is.
made him feel happy. Why did it make him feel happy right now? Because she got a picture. Because she got a picture? Okay. So we make sure they know what's happening in the story, and then it's on there for the same amount of time, regardless of how long it takes you to answer, because we want to make sure everyone's getting exposed to the information for the same amount of time. So sometimes if you answer fast, it's boring. <laughs> It's cool because she looked at the type of swing and then said tire swing. I think it's just cool. Okay. Remember, these two things happen to Megan. So this is to recenter their attention and make them both as salient. Well, many days later, Megan is walking to school. the scale they point to. She went over to that positive and downgraded it to money. Thanks. We also had a probability so scale with pegs they pointed to. What did we find? So this graph, the other ones are going to be set up like this too. So this is um, looking at future likelihood, so whether they thought something good or bad is going to happen next. So um, again, they had might, probably, definitely. So if you go up, this is might, something good might happen, probably will happen, definitely will happen. As you go down, something bad might happen, probably will happen, definitely will happen, okay? So what you want to pay attention to here is that um, from the negative standpoint, the older you get, the more negative you view those high-risk situations. Um, and this doesn't change as much with age, but um, you're going up <coughs> slightly for double positive. But one thing that I think is really fascinating about this is what's happening with these ambiguous risk situations. So one thing to point out here, too, is that four- and five-year-olds are differentiating between every risk type. There's significant differences between every one. So even as young as four years of age, they're integrating that past event information to make these future-oriented <coughs> forecasts. But what you'll notice is that it gets wider, the spread gets wider as they get older. Um, this, I think, is most fascinating to me because these were the same exact events in reverse order. So they got eight trials of these, and this is averaged across the trials. And so the older you get, the more you see these as very different kinds of situations. And by eight to 10 years of age, you're actually viewing that as a negative, having a negative forecast in those situations. So you can look at this by emotion intensity. It follows the same pattern. Again, the four and five-year-olds 
are differentiating among all the risk types, but the older you get, the more you see these as very different kinds of situations when you're thinking about how worried or happy you're going to feel. So this would be feeling very happy, very worried. Okay, and you'll also see young kids don't think you should feel very worried in high-risk situations. Um, and it's not that they have necessarily wrong ideas about that. So sometimes they'll explain it like, well, she did, he did two bad things before, so now he's really ready to say he's sorry. Um, so that should be, she should be happy about that because now the good thing's gonna happen, the bad things are over. So they come up with kind of sensible things for that, but they're definitely much more optimistic about people um, than older kids and adults are. Um, again, you see this increase in spread um, between these ambiguous risk situations where you're paying attention to timing and you're basically violating mathematical probability. It looks the same way when you do distance decision, although at least here the kids are noticing that they should probably be on the edge of staying away from those kinds of people. But again, you get this nice spread with age. Okay, so what about eye movement patterns? So when you look at this final scene, this would be the initial past event, this would be the most recent past event, and this would be the current event. So how do you do a recency bias? The way you do this um, in the literature is you take the looking time to the most recent event minus the looking time to the initial event, and you divide it by how much they're looking by most. So that gives you the sort of a relative um, how much attention you're giving to one kind of event versus another. And if you do this, zero means you're looking at them equally. So if you were given two pieces of information about a person and you were to weight them both the same way and see them both as important pieces of information, you should have no biased attention whatsoever. You should be looking at them equally, pretty much how the four and five-year-olds are doing. Both pieces of information are informative. You should be hovering around zero. Um, but even the four and five-year-olds do these little bump ups. So notice what's happening. When that second event is negative, people care a lot. And the older you get, the more you care what that last event was, especially if it's something negative. So only the adults care when that second event um, is positive and they look more at the recency effect um, for positive. But this is shown in a lot of literature that the offset for negative events is usually much, much stronger than the offset for positive events. So back to that question, can you predict reasoning based on where people are looking in these ambiguous situations? The answer is yes, and you can do it a lot better for this second negative event. So the more people looked at that second negative event, the more likely they predicted that something bad was going to happen. The more likely they said that that person was worried or very worried, and the more likely they predicted an avoidance decision. The same goes true for positive. If they looked more at the positive event here, they thought more, it was more likely that good things were gonna happen, people would feel happy, and people would make approach decisions. So this is really, um, people when they do eye tracking research tend to just do it as this passive thing where they're just looking at looking. Um, to my knowledge, no one has tried to pair verbal explanations actually having a conversation about what's on the screen and looking at whether you can look at connections between eye movements and the kinds of judgments people make. So this was a very high-risk project. Luckily, NSF wanted to fund it. Um, but this is really cool that you can actually, even in this situation where you're having back and forth between an experimenter and a participant, you can get these kinds of um, patterns. So. Summing this up, even four and five-year-olds make distinctions between the four risk types. Um, but this risk type, this differentiation by risk type is widening with age. And not all past events are equal. So there's an age-related movement towards what a lot of decision-making scientists call the heuristic-based approach. And that's when you deviate from mathematical probability and you give more weight to some kinds of information over others. So what we see is that the older you get, the more you care about recency effects, and especially if that recent event is negative. So moving on, how else can you study these kinds of things? So we were wanting to know whether they expect people to generalize from the past when meeting someone new. So maybe you had a horrible experience with one person of a certain category, but then you meet someone new from that category. Should you have a biased expectations about what that person would be like? Should you feel worried or happy or think about the future in certain ways or make decisions based on another person who looks similar to them. Should you do those sorts of things? And do people think people's minds actually do that? So in 2007, I had published um, an article, you can find this, this is also in Child Development, where we found that even children as young as four expect people to generalize worry 
in situations when there was a single negative event and then you saw a perpetrator who looked similar to that person. But this is a little bit different. Now we're saying, okay, we just found in that last study that order matters a lot. People, the older you get, the more you anchor to that second event. Should you be doing this anchoring kinds of stuff when you're meeting someone new? Does the order in which someone from that category did something before shape how you think about how this new person is? Or should you then move back to this kind of mathematical reasoning? Sometimes they do something good, sometimes they do something bad. So we wanted to see if order would still matter here. Um, because logically, probably shouldn't. Okay. And then also, how far do children and adults expect the past to generalize? So this is another very large sample of four to 10 year olds and adults. We modify the sequences so everybody who comes back in the final scene just looks similar. So all trials are ambiguous. You haven't seen this person before. You have no past experience with this particular um, agent. We recorded eye movements throughout. So just to show you, this would be um, a double positive. This big teenager boy shares a remote control car with Adam. The next day, he helps him up after he fell, and then he sees him. A big teenager boy, sorry, who he's never seen before. So he looks similar. We tell them explicitly it's not the same one. So a double negative, locked him in a closet one day at school and ripped up his favorite picture. Should be a high risk situation if that's the same one. Um, this is a similar looking person. Adam sees a big teenager boy who he's never seen before. Positive negative, shared the car, then locked him in a closet. Locked him in a closet, but then shared a car. So again, we're doing the same exact events in reverse order. So you predict the thought, good or bad will happen, whether the character feels worried or happy, and whether he'll go near or stay away. So what we found, this is the same kind of thing. So going up, think something good, going down, think something bad. Four to five year olds don't care. Not that they don't care, they're generally positive. You meet someone new, you should probably think something good is, might happen, okay? Six to seven year olds start to care a little bit. They're differentiating between the double negative and double positive situations. So you should feel a little bit happier to see someone who looks like someone who's helped you twice before versus harmed you twice before. The older you get, the more you think there should be differences among all of these. So this looks very, very similar to what we saw before when it's the same exact person coming back. And it's actually interesting when I showed <laughs> these data to my um, younger daughter a couple years, actually like a year or two ago, and she's like, the adults are all wrong. Why are they doing this? This is how you should be reasoning um, because there's someone new. Like, why wouldn't you just give them the benefit of the doubt and assume, you know, there's something, there, there's someone new. Why should you have these, like, really strong biases against people you have never met before? So you can see it when you do emotion intensity, too. Four to five-year-olds don't, they're not actually differentiating any of those. Six to seven start to at least say, well, you'd be happier to see someone who looks like someone who helped you twice before. Eight to 10 year olds start to separate them out, but they don't care about order. Adults do. So order matters, even when you're meeting someone new. You can look at it for decisions. Four and five year olds, yeah, I'll go near people. Six to sevens, they're at least differentiating the double negative from the double positive. Eight to tens, for decisions, separate them all out, and adults do so too. So you might be thinking in your mind, how does this really line up from before? I know these pictures look kind of similar. We'll put them together. This is what I showed you from the last study. This is what's going on right now. So before, if it's the same person coming back, even the, the four and five year olds differentiate by all the different risk situations, when it's someone similar, the older they get, the more you do this, expect this generalization from the past. This is by um, decision judgments. What about eye movements? Should you have this overweighting kind of bias in eye movements? Well, yes, you do. Um, which is interesting, and the older you get, the more you see it. So this is increasing with age. Again, you see that greater offset for negative things. When negative things happen last, they make a bigger difference. They should be looked at more. And if you think that looked eerily similar to what you saw before, this is when it's the same person coming back, and this is when it's similar. So in an age where you can't really replicate, a lot of people are coming under fire for not being able to replicate findings, this is a very nice replication and showing that the older you get, the more you're doing that even when it's a similar looking um, agent. It doesn't even have to be the same one. Does it predict reasoning? You're like, okay, well maybe they have these biases, but maybe they're realizing it's a new person, so therefore I shouldn't base my judgments on how I'm visually inspecting this information. No, this works even better. So 
The more I look at the negative thing about what somebody else did, the more I think something bad's gonna happen with this new person, the more I should feel worried, and the more I think this person's gonna avoid. And it works really well the other way too. So the more participants exhibited a recency heuristic in their eye movements, the more they generalized from the past to this new similar agent. Then we thought, well, how far can we push this? So we had them predict in motions when encountering additional agents who vary in degree of similarity from the past. So how will Adam feel when he sees this boy? So we have um, these new people. So this is a different boy than before. Um, and then you can see what we're varying there. How about when he sees this boy? How about when he sees this girl? How about when he sees this girl? So we vary like degree of similarity versus difference in these new people. Okay, four to five year olds don't care. They're saying um, generally you should feel a little happy anytime you see someone, okay? Six to sevens, maybe a little bit between the NN and PP, but not quite there yet. Eight to 10 year olds, it's there for the double negative, double positive. Again, extending even beyond to people who really don't look like the original perpetrator. And adults care about all of them, which I thought was pretty surprising. So adults think people generalize a lot. So what about reasoning? So we, we looked at how often they reference the past to explain this unknown agent. So things like because the other short haired girl did something bad to her, so she'll probably think this girl will do something bad to her. Because the last person of that type he met did something bad. Because the other one recently did something good to her. Because he had good experiences with the other one. So what you see increasing with age, this is the proportion of trials they referred to the past when explaining these determinative mental states you see a nice linear increase with age. So the older you get, the more you recognize that people's past experiences cause these generalizations to new people and new situations. So we have an age-related increase in awareness that the mind generalizes from the past. We can see this in verbal judgments. We can see this in eye movement patterns. We can see this in explanation. So you see it across the board in all the dependent variables you're measuring. And eight to 10 year olds presume broader future generalizations in line with the past than children, and adults do it a lot more than children do. So what's interesting about this is this increasing knowledge that people's mental states about individuals, about their experience with one particular person, can then extend to categories of people who share some kind of similarity. So I wanted to, in, I'll take three, four minutes, and so we'll still have time for questions, maybe five minutes, that's not fast though, to tell you a little bit about what we're doing now and what you might think, what about this? Maybe you've thought of some of these things. What about three event sequences? You guys thinking about that? What would happen then? Well, you kept made a big deal about how recency matters, but from a mathematical standpoint, frequency should matter too. So what if you pit these things against each other? What matters more? Um, the last thing you did or whether you did more of one kind of thing versus another? This. <laughs> I'm laughing because you may not have ever thought of this, <laughs> but I thought of this and I thought, okay, well maybe we read these, use these heuristics and read this intentionality and these extra kinds of things when it's people, but if it's just winning and losing and it's a machine who doesn't really care who you are, then you should go back to mathematical probability, I would hope, um, but we'll see. Do they differentiate between who the perpetrator is? And then we also thought, well, let's expand this a little bit more. How about whether how these past event sequences shape how mean or nice you think someone is, whether you would want to help that person, whether you would want to be friends with them, um, what would you do in that situation, and how do they actually remember these kinds of events over time? Do they remember certain things like the last thing people did much better after a week delay than the first thing they did, and so on. And I should mention before, I didn't have time to talk about today, the reason why we had so many participants in those last two studies is because we have another hour and a half of assessments of lots of individual differences on them in relation to um, mental health and a lot of different other cognitive processes. So mathematical probability reasoning, there's a lot of math in thinking about people and that actually predicts pretty well. Um, so we also did a lot of individual difference measures in this current study we're doing right now. So I just wanted to give you an example of what a double negative followed by positive trial is. So tries to shove her off the swing, tells her she can't play, but I don't know why I did that, okay. But then, gives her a nice picture. How would you do this in a machine? Well, we created this place called Gameland, where there's all these distinctive kinds of machines that give winning or losing tickets, and you can use those tickets to purchase things. So, 
losing ticket, losing ticket, winning ticket. Again, we would assume this machine could care less who she is, right? All right, so this is preliminary data. This is with 138 people. We still have um, quite a bit more to go. This is human trial decisions. So this is how sure you are that you're, this is, um, that you're going to go near this person or stay away from this person. So we change it to a, a six point scale this time. So um, this is your certainty that you're going to uh, make an approach or avoidance decision. Okay, PNN, the older you get, very similar to before, the more negative you think it is and the more likely you're going to stay away from that person. But look at this, same events in, um, but different timing. They care, even the four and five year olds care. You're much more likely to approach someone if you do those things in the reverse order than if the last two were negative and you see this across age. Okay, so what if you did a negative and then two positive things? Again, that's um, different, but that feels different than if you did two positive things followed by a negative. So all the age groups, they're taking into account frequency, but they're caring about the recency effect too. So even when you move this up to three event sequences, you can find evidence that four and five year olds can do this. And the older you get, the more they're making these very clean distinctions. What about machines? What do you think is happening there? Do you think that's a recency thing or that's more based on mathematical probability? Okay. Four and five year olds, not really differentiating, but they were before. So if we go back before, they were doing it, right? For people, they were doing it for people, not doing it for machines. Look what they're doing. Frequency, doesn't matter the timing in which you won or lost, it matters how many times you won or lost. So this is when you've lost twice, this is when you've won twice. Um, you're much more likely to play that machine again versus stay away from it based on frequency, but they don't care about recency. Eight to 10 year olds, again, frequency matters, but they care about recency too. <laughs> so uh, maybe adults have a lot more gambling experiences and things like that where you're like, oh, it's on a streak and therefore I should keep playing. Um, but six to 10 year olds go by frequency. Um, adults are going, also factoring in recency into these kinds of decisions. So I just wanted to spotlight this one. So let's say, double positive followed by a negative trial. Do you go by frequency or do you go by recency? So what's interesting is these are the same from the valence perspective and a timing perspective, identical. It just matters whether it's a machine or a person doing these things to you. And you're much more likely to give a machine the benefit of the doubt than a person. Okay, recency matters a lot more for humans. So this is cool. I know we're running out of time, but this is cool. Okay, so. Does recency always matter? Remember I said we had all these other kinds of judgments too, or are there places where just frequency matters? You don't care about the timing of things. You're making judgments about people just based on how often they do good things versus bad things. Okay, this is human perpetrators here. So these are the people doing the actions. These are the people who were the victims or benefactors of those actions. So you might wonder, are these people mean or nice? We don't know anything about them. If you were to guess, are they mean or nice? Would you help someone who has been victimized or helped by other people? Would you want to be friends with these people? Okay, so this is the doers. These are the people being done to. Okay, frequency is all that matters. This is collapsed across age. You don't find age differences. You're much more likely to think these people are mean who have instances of two negative things versus these people are generally nice. Would you help them? Um, you're not quite sure about helping these guys who've harmed twice in the past, but it doesn't matter the order, but you'd probably help the people, or you might, it's actually not so sure you'd help, but it's on the positive side. This is interesting too, because they talk about like how you have greater obligation to help people than be friends with people. So you see that here and you see it across age. So again, you're going by frequency you're not gonna be friends with the people who harm twice, regardless of what order that happened in. Okay, what about these guys? Do you think they're mean or nice? Would you have any idea? They're all nice. So even though they may have the slide before that I never showed you, done something, done something to instigate that harm, our assumption is, hey, they're nice. I'd help all of them and I'd be friends with all of them. 
Um, so we thought that was really intriguing too, of because um, this doesn't really actually play out in real life. A lot of people who are victimized by their peers are not people who people are running to to help and befriend. So that's kind of interesting, and we're going to try to figure out what's going on there. So frequency matters most for traits and post-social judgment. So going back to the original question, when can kids do this? Um, by four to five years of age, they um, reveal really surprising insights. A lot of this is continuing to change and develop between four and ten years of age, knowing how frequency and timing shapes these future oriented expectations, but also recognizing that people's minds are going to generalize from the past, even when they're meeting someone new, even when they're in a totally new situation. And then you have further development into adulthood. And as I said, what I didn't touch on, there's loads of individual differences here. So even among adults, there's a lot of variability in how you think about these kinds of situations. Um, okay, we still have a couple minutes. This, this is just a final bigger picture thing. For those of you who have taken developmental psychology with me or no developmental psychology or cognitive development, when you talk about theory of mind, what do you talk about? Preschoolers, right? Three, four, and five-year-olds. And by the time they're you know, four and a half, five years of age, they understand false belief. And suddenly, you know everything about people's minds. Most, I would say 95 or more percent of the research on theory of mind is all done with preschoolers. What I hope you can learn from this talk is that there's a lot that goes on after that. There's a lot more sophisticated ways you can think about people and minds and how all these things integrate the older you get. And it's not just about false belief. People tend to create methods for kids, and then they create methods for adults. And a lot of, there's not a lot of cross-communication between these different kinds of methodologies. So I hope I've been able to convince you it's feasible to use the same methods with kids and adults and see how it changes across time. And that you can also bridge social cognitive measures, these traditional story-based procedures, with more cutting-edge eye-tracking new technology to see how they're processing and weighting information when they're making these kinds of social cognition types of judgments. And so the last thing I just wanted to say here is that a lot of theory of mind, the way it's taught to you guys in undergraduate classes is when do kids develop a theory of mind? When is it present? Um, where, when is it absent? So research on autism focuses a lot on do they have um, a delayed or an absent theory of mind? But what I want to do is get beyond this presence, absence kind of approach to think about, well, what evolves with age and your life experiences, all of the fact that you are having different life experiences than the people around you, are your intuitions about the sources, contents, interconnections, and consequences of having those mental states, not whether you have beliefs or have thoughts or have emotions, but what you think that means for your everyday lives and relationships. So I just want to thank um, people who've helped with this and funding and thank you for your attention. And we do have like seven minutes or so for questions. So I'm happy to take any questions. You don't have to be intimidated. Uh -huh. Okay, gender is an interesting thing. So one thing I didn't talk about um, is we also have a paper that's coming out um, probably next week um, where, we, you know how I, when I presented the data, I did thoughts separately, emotions separately, decisions separately. So if you do it that way, there's no gender differences. Um, where we do find gender differences in, is in how certain they think about the future. So how um, the intensity of worry, the intensity, like if you just base it on not whether the valence of whether they thought good or bad, but how sure they were of that, females across age starting at age four up to adults tend to think the future is a lot more uncertain. We think that's pretty interesting. Another thing that happens is we did a paper, that's the one that's coming out next week, where we looked at how did they connect those judgments together. So that thoughts influence emotions, influence decisions. So how often did they say like, um, think something good, feel happy approach, think something bad, feel worried, avoid. So those would be like valence match triads. What we find are, are gender differences there. Um, females don't, gen don't valence match triads as much as males do, and you see this across age. And where the break is, is in thinking that someone could anticipate something good, feel happy, some degree of happy, but still choose to avoid. So where they're breaking it is where you see this sort of pattern um, that potentially could put um, females at higher risk for anxiety. So we know females have higher um, risk of anxiety disorders, and a lot of the things that I've been doing over time have been finding these sort of subtle gender differences that could end up um, making a difference. Um, none of these people have diagnosed anxiety, but it, we thought that gender effect was actually um, really intriguing, that they're, they're, break, they're not 
assuming that people are going to necessarily make approach decisions even when they think um, something good will happen and even when they feel happy, but we think it's because they're less certain about how good, you know, the likelihood that something good will happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so where do these heuristics and biases come from? So one, one clue we have is um, younger kids who, who seem to be, at least with their eye movement patterns and in their judgment, seem to be reasoning a little bit more mathematically, right? They're, they're at least looking at both pieces of information equally. And, and when you're thinking about someone new, they're not generalizing as much as the older kids um, and adults. So if you just did analyses of how certain they were, so what, how often they said some whatever they said good or bad was definitely gonna happen. The younger you are, the more certain you think whatever you think is gonna happen in the future is sure to happen, okay? What we found is around seven or eight years of age, that drops incredibly. And you start to recognize that the future is not certain, that you can't know. And what we think is that's probably what's instigating this new heuristic-based approach because the more people thought that the future was uncertain, the more they started to do this overweighting of the second event. So I think when you realize that it's hard to know what's gonna happen next, it's hard to make these kind of forecasts, you have to come up with some quick shortcuts or heuristics of how to deal with this uncertainty. If you don't know there's uncertainty to deal with, you're not gonna do that. So I think part of it is that you're learning the future is uncertain, so you need a shortcut. And sometimes those shortcuts probably do end up in stereotypical thinking and prejudice and things like that um, because it's, it's faster to do it in that way versus to say, well, wait, this is not a person I've met before. I don't know this and this and this about them. These quick judgments tend to happen and you need to actually use more cognitive control to get over those quick assumptions and to say, no, this is a new person. This is a new individual. I shouldn't have those biased expectations. But that, a lot of researchers think, takes a lot more effort than doing this sort of shortcut approach. Mm -hmm. We have that. So in the 2013 <laughs> paper, you're like, oh, machine, what about an animal? They reasoned very similarly about animals and humans. Um, and because animals are intentional creatures too. So um, that's, if you're interested, the 2013 paper has that. The only difference you see is they're much more positive about animals. So they differentiate by all the risk types for animals, but they're just generally more positive about animals. And I think it's because there's a lot of research showing that our general default assumption is that people are good. Um, and you have to, and negative information then becomes diagnostic. So the more negative things someone does, the more likely you think, oh, that's not the type of person I really want to be around. I think animals are a little bit different because you don't know, like if you're approaching a dog you've never seen before and they start wagging their tail and they seem really calm, that's very diagnostic information too. Your default isn't all dogs are nice, all cats are nice. You wait and see. So I think the positive information was weighted a little bit more heavily for the animals potentially than the people and that's why it boosted everything up. But generally, yeah, everyone thought that animals would do really nice things um, and be friendly, but not people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. cookie, then we think, okay, this is, I mean, I would think maybe this is a nice person, and then in the future events, they might be nice regardless. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Words, so we're we, reasoning about different types of other people. Yeah, so we have, a, you could push forward a lot. So one thing that we thought about is going back to that slide that we had where they think that all, all these people are nice for some reason. Mm -hmm. Well, what if we gave, like, where there was, like, hidden information that you didn't know, you knew something happened, but we don't, we're not gonna give you that information to see if they might downgrade some of this niceness. Or what if this target then does something the next time, how does that then change the dynamic? Does it erase the dynamic? So yeah, you could extend these forward where um, it's, a, it's a going back and forth. Um, and maybe if, you d if someone did negative and you did negative, maybe that's considered okay. But if you did, this person did negative and you did positive, somehow you were then even a better person or something for that. But yeah, you could do a lot of, as I said, I started with these one event sequences and like, okay, let's try two, because that's hard to do with young kids. But um, 
but yeah, we three is working, so it would be interesting to sort of extend that out um, even more. I also want to try to, I'm thinking about um, collaborating with people who do um, ERP work because there's, um, there's a reaction you can get in um, ERP called um, the, N, the N400 um, of, of unexpectedness. And so I'm interested in whether the positive followed by negative is much more unexpected than a negative followed by positive. Because negative followed by positive is socially normative. If someone harms you and then they do something good to you, then you're like, okay, that's a socially normative person. They're trying to make some kind of repair for something they did. But kind of the worst sort of person is someone who you think is your friend and is doing nice things and then does something really harmful. So potentially why that negative in that last position is so attention getting from an eye movement standpoint, from a verbal judgment standpoint, from a reasoning standpoint, is because it's so unexpected and so wrong when it comes to how humans um, should treat each other. Other questions? <coughs> like one minute left, 30 seconds. Yeah. Yeah. I all want to go. All right, well, if you have other questions afterwards, just come up and say hi. All right, thank you.